Welcome back. It's so lovely to see so many faces that I might not have seen for a year or two. I'm Amy Goikachea. I'm the Director of Programs and Events. And this is our 31st annual Western Visions show and sale. Yay for us. <laughs> been in every every show. Kent, I'm looking at you very much. <laughs> and then there are others. And then there are a handful each year who are brand new to the show as well. So please take, take some time after this fabulous presentation. If you have not yet wandered through the galleries and gotten to know the sketches and paintings and sculptures and prints that all 107 of our amazing artists have contributed this year, please do so. And then if you do not yet have your ticket, for the artist party or the show and sale or both, I encourage you to purchase those as well. My assistant Jeff Listitian is right outside and would happily sell you a ticket to one or both evenings. It will be lots of fun. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dustin Van Wenchel, Amy Elizabeth Lay, Andrew Denman, and September Bay, who were so gracious when I asked Dustin if he would be willing to give this year's presentation. He didn't hesitate, he said yes, and then he recruited these other fabulous people. Uh, 16 years ago, Dustin left a successful career in the advertising industry to pursue his lifelong passion of becoming a fine art full-time painter. Since then, in those 16 short years, Dustin has earned numerous distinctions and awards including the 2015 Bob Kuhn Award for Wildlife at the Masters of the American West show in Los Angeles, the 2015 Premier Platinum Award in Cody at the Buffalo Bill show, the Wildlife Award and the Teton Lodge Company Award at the 2006 Arts for the Parks competition. He's also been featured in several leading art publications <laughs> since then, Art of the West, Western Art Collector Magazine, Southwest Art, the Artists Magazine, the Pastel Journal, and Drawing Magazine. His work has been exhibited all throughout the US in one-man shows, major art exhibitions, and in museums, including our own, the Autry National, National Center, and the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, the Booth Museum, and the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. Please join me in welcoming Dustin Van Wetchel to <laughs> everybody for coming out this morning. Looks like we got a pretty good crowd. Um, I'm always excited to talk about my favorite subject, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll grab a clicker here and we'll get started. These presentations are really to provide people insight into quite a diverse group of artists. We all paint very differently. We've all had different life experiences and we all work very differently. And so I kind of chose these guys with that in mind. That way you guys can kind of get insight into how we do all this stuff why it happens the way it does. So, uh, we'll get started. So, a brief history of me and the influence has led to my career as a painter. I, uh, this is maybe going back to the This might be too early. Uh, but, uh, but you see how happy I'm in there. <laughs> so, I, when I was three years old, my folks moved me from my place of birth, which was Yuma, Arizona, to a smaller town, if you can believe that, Quartzsite, Arizona. Off of Interstate 10 in the Sonoran Desert. And I'm often asked as a painter, what led to me becoming a painter? And why did I choose wildlife? The answer to choosing why I chose wildlife is because I lived out basically in the middle of nowhere. And it was an amazing place for a little kid. I would spend most of my free time when I wasn't in school just just collecting animals, putting them in jars, or sticking them in the shower of our trailer home. Things like, uh, you know, Western Diamondbacks. Sorry, Yvonne, she's terrified of snakes, by the way. Um, tarantulas, those are one of my favorites. My mom hated me for putting these in the shower. Uh, as a kid, this was like winning the lottery, these horn toads. It, uh, we call them horny toads or horn lizards. It was amazing. So I had all of that, I had my friends, and that just kind of um, set me up to really appreciate the outdoors. Um, but when I was nine, my folks left 
Portside, Arizona, and moved to the big city. And that's really why I became an artist. Um, the animals in such a why, I, I just grew up with a love of animals. And my mom is a full-blown, straight-jacket, crazy animal lover. And that rubbed off on me a lot. And so that's really why I came about it. But the reason I'm an artist is because of this move. Um, I left all of that. I left all my friends. I was probably a little insecure as a kid, very shy. And I sort of retreated into drawing when we moved to the big city. I went from a school that had 100 students in it to a school that had 1,000 students in it. Um, and this is in the third grade. And so I didn't make friends easily and such. So I just kind of found corners to sit and draw. Um, it didn't take long before I realized that drawing, uh, I was getting a lot of attention for drawing. I had become a little better than my peers at it. And my peers would come to me and be kind of wowed by what I was doing. And I discovered it was a way to actually make friends. Um, and so I drew more and more. It got me more and more attention. I made more and more friends that way. And that occurred and, and kind of happened all the way up through high school. Um, but at some point in high school, it switched from a way to make friends and get attention to just something I enjoyed doing. It just became a part of who I was. I wanted to do it all the time outside of the friends and the attention. And that's really why I became an artist. Um, now, like for example, I will have worked all this summer, seven days a week, 10 hours a day, uh, doing pieces, getting ready for shows. And by the time I put that last brush stroke on that last piece, I'm just exhausted. I don't want to see another painting. But two weeks from now, I'll just be itching to get back in the studio. And it just, it's just that way. It's just a part of who I am. My artist influences. So I could go by and tell you all the, the ones that are obvious. The, the Bob Coombs, the, the Carl Ruggieses, the William Kunerts, the artists like that. Those are obvious in my work. But their influences are more important now than what led me to become an artist. <clears throat> the artists that really influenced me as a kid were science fiction and fantasy illustrators. I was obsessed with that stuff. Artists like Frank Frazetta, uh, he was one of my favorites, of course. I spent years just copying his work, trying to figure out how he do anatomy and things like that. Um, Boris Vallejo, um, as I got older and moved into high school, later in high school, I started to enjoy artists like Phil Hale, who did these really kind of surrealistic, very large paintings, um, and very strange paintings. I was into some weird stuff as a kid, but I always found them really interesting. Uh, and I love the painting style. And then as I moved up from there, I started discovering artworks from like Maxfield Parish and uh, J.W. Waterhouse, one of my favorites as well. Um, and all of these works instill a kind of <laughs> desire to produce narrative works like this as well. My paintings, anytime I sit down to do a painting, I, um, I'm sitting down to do a story, essentially. And a lot of that is drawn from these artists that influenced me very early on, um, Bovaro as well. These were all incredibly important to me becoming an artist. Um, as an artist, a wildlife artist in particular, um, you have to travel quite a lot to find your subject matter. Um, I'm obsessed with mountains, and in particular the Rocky Mountains of the American West. Um, always have been. Something about the mountains, I just I cannot get enough of them. Um, and so I spend a lot of time there in particular. This is a spot from Glacier, for example. Um, but I've been to the Canadian Rockies. Um, I've been to Alaska above the Arctic Circle and spent several weeks up there just walking around in the middle of nowhere, completely lost, basically. Um, and I've been to uh, lots of countries. <coughs> I've been from Australia to Europe, Mexico, um, lots of different places to find inspiration for paintings. Uh, one of the places I haven't been to, which is high on my list, is Africa. So that's probably <coughs> going to be my next trip. Um, but I'm still very much in love with the Rocky Mountain West. And you can see that in my work. It's really all I focus on painting. Um, <clears throat> my work, the studio, and my process. So my day is pretty rough. I, uh, I get up bright and early. Oh, well, actually, we're starting with work. I got a little bit on my side. So that's some early work. Um, because, <laughs> I think you can see the talent. Uh, 
So, you know, I was maybe 16, 17 when I was a kid. <laughs> Cut 20 years later, and this is six months later. <laughs> Priscilla, God, I love that word. Um, no, my, my, here's some examples of my work. Um, for those of you who don't know well, except maybe outside of the Western Vision Show, etc. Um, this piece is called Slow Drift. It, it's funny where you, ideas come from for paintings. Um, sometimes I struggle with ideas. I could spend a month trying to work on an idea and never arrive at something that I really like. And other times they happen right away. They're sometimes inspired by a photo I've taken or a plein air piece I've done or just an experience that I take home with me and I'm like, I've got to find a way to communicate that on canvas. Um, and it can also be as easy as just finding a pond with some really interesting lily pads. Uh, and that was the case with this piece. Um, I tend to design everything in my paintings. I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't copy the photos or anything like that. I'm taking pieces and pushing them around and I'm thinking about literally where every rock is going, where every leaf is going to go, if it's being detailed in that regard, how the animal works within that environment. That's all incredibly important to me as part of the design process. And I think it stems from me coming from advertising. I actually spent my professional career before I left to become a fine artist as, a, as an art director and graphic designer. And that's what my education is in. So I look to find ways of pushing all of that into a painting um, without it looking like a graphic design piece. So um, Amy had mentioned uh, the Bob Kuhn Award at the Art Trade Center. This was actually the painting that won the award. Um, there are sometimes trips that just provide mountains and mountains of reference and inspiration. This painting was inspired by one of those trips. It was, I was an uh, artist in residence at Rocky Mountain National Park. I spent two weeks there in the park. They provide you a place free of charge, and you're just immersed in the park the whole time. And I was lucky enough to have a herd of bull elk, summer bull elk, who just literally hung around the cabin all the time. I, could, I was even able to paint them because they would just lay there for hours on end. And I was like, okay, both of them. And that doesn't happen very often. You can literally do a plenary painting of an animal just laying there. So that's where this piece was inspired from. I got to spend two weeks with these guys. Um, I don't mind painting things that aren't necessarily in their prime. It, it, of course, we always see the kind of stereotypical elk in his fall coat and horn or antlers, and everything looks amazing, and he's really active and aggressive. I, this story is about kind of the more docile nature of them during the summer when they're just fattening up and they have these really amazing red coats and velvet antlers. And so that's what that piece is about. This is a piece really nobody but a few people has seen. I did it as a commission um, and didn't publish it, um, but it's a snowy owl piece. Uh, I don't do a lot of commissions. If I did one a year, that's actually a lot. Um, and the reason is I have a hard time fitting them into my schedule. And generally, collectors, I just don't want to make them wait a year to get a painting. But when they are willing to wait a year, in the case of this collector, he was. Um, he wanted a snowy owl scene. And when I approach a commission, I generally do three different ideas, completely different ideas about the piece. And so I did three ideas. I submitted them. And he liked them so much that he chose two of them to do rather than just one. And this was one of the pieces. And honestly, as an artist, I'm, I'm one of those artists who, I had actually been at a presentation that Morgan Weissing had done, and he talked about how a lot of his paintings, there's just a specific part that he's just excited to paint. He just can't wait to get to that part. This painting had a lot of that. I could not wait to paint the white and white of this piece. The painting, uh, in real life, you can't, it doesn't show up well in here, but the painting is really thick. The paint is really thick. It's a really heavy and fast stuff. You're trowelling on. So, the effect is that you get this snow that just sparkles under the correct light, and that was an absolute joy to paint. <laughs> uh, another piece inspired, actually, uh, Ray, my friend, an artist here in the, uh, in the audience, he and I spent some time in the glacier, happened upon uh, these bighorn sheep. And bighorn sheep are probably, those in Mountain West are probably my two favorite animals to paint. Um, I've had the best experiences as an artist with them in the field, being able to just sit down in the grass at high altitude and take in the awe-inspiring vistas of their high altitude environments. And so, and they just, they just let you do it. If you're just relaxed and they're just kind of 
doing their thing around you, they don't pay any attention to you, it's, it's just a wonderful place to be. And so this was inspired by some time in Glacier with them. Um, and then of course the Mountain Goats as well. Um, what I was really excited about to paint about this painting was just the light. I love midday light, painting midday light. A lot of artists would like to paint you know, evening light or magic hour light, you know, early morning, late evening. But midday is just as exciting to me. Um, it's an opportunity to push colors and shadows and create that kind of UV glow you get, especially in high altitude environments. This thing just keeps just... Uh, <laughs> of course, it's pretty embarrassing. I just liked um, designing this piece with all the varying structural lines and angles. This was a piece actually two years ago that was here at Western Visions. Uh, you may or may not remember it. I kind of found, I generally stay away from painting birds. I just find painting them a little bit on the tedious side. Uh, but I've sort of started, due to the influence of some other artist friends of mine, started <coughs> enjoying painting ravens and such uh, a little more. Uh, they certainly have a lot of personality, so. And then this is a piece I did very recently. I think it's only about a year and a half old. Those mountain lines. The title of the painting is um, Pie for Dessert. <laughs> I'm sure you can work that out for yourself. I always kind of, it's funny too, because I kind of think, you know, in reality, he's probably not going to get the magpie, and the magpie is just like some sort of bird adrenaline junkie, who just parks right there, hoping, like, you know, he can tell his buddies. Yeah, I was sitting next to a cougar, it's no big deal. So this is how my day starts. <laughs> Uh, I get up, have breakfast, take a nice pre-painting nap uh, before I get started. And then I kind of move into my afternoon soaps. <laughs> um, you guys, you can't just jump into paint. I mean, that takes a lot of, a lot of exercise. You know, and then after this point, it's a solid 30 or 40 minutes of painting. And then because I'm basically a stay-at-home husband, I. Uh, I have to do my chores. <laughs> I make sure that's all that. Um, you can see my studio is pretty nice. It is cozy. It does have an indoor toilet, so that's <laughs> pretty handy. Actually, uh, this is my studio. It's a panoramic of the studio. My studio is in my home. Um, we built a portion of the house just specifically for the studio. It's nothing giant, it's about 450 square feet, but it's incredibly pleasant space to be in. Um, I go in there just to read or watch movies or work as well. Um, not as much as Yvonne thinks, because I can shut the door and she doesn't know what's going on in there. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's just a nice space to hang out in. So my process, all right. Here's where all the secrets are going to be pulled. Um, as you may be aware, I don't know if you are or not, but we generally start with a blank canvas. And I will tone it with uh, sepia tone. And then the second step is basically just finish the painting. <laughs> <laughs> so just some nice insights. <laughs> Actually, this painting is currently over at Trailside, so I'm going to show you here in a second a, a little time-lapse video. The painting took about 120 hours uh, worth of painting. It's a 55 by 44. Um, I did some. I was going to do a time-lapse video of the whole process, and discovered fairly quickly in the process that one, as soon as you finish the block-in stage, which is kind of the rough end where everything looks basically like it should, um, which took about six hours. After you get past that, the time lapse just doesn't work very well. It's like nothing happens for hours and hours. Or at least that's how it appears. So I did the first six hours, uh, and you'll be able to see how that goes. And it's just a two-minute video. Oh, so. no, there's no sound. So this is the basically the draw, rough drawing stage. I'm just inking in, essentially, with paint, a rough drawing.
once the rough drawings are uh, in, I generally put in the darkest darks of the painting, and I know that all my values will work backwards from there. And so the noses, the eyes, uh, the horns will be the darkest parts, and everything from there is lighter. You'll notice I'm using a magic brush and it never needs to be refilled. <laughs> Once this stage passes, um, I work, you can see I, I kind of work all over the canvas. Gen a general rule of top to bottom, back to front, but in the block in, I basically work everywhere. It allows me to push edges around and things like that. Uh, but once it gets past this stage, and the paint really starts thickening up, and I really start dialing in values and color temperatures and the colors themselves, um, it slows way down. But as you see, the painting looks very similar to what it did before. So doing a whole time lapse of the whole thing just really didn't make sense. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that when I paint, in particular, like for example, all of those, uh, all of that uh, red brush, it's just, it's layer upon layer of paint, laying it down, letting it dry for a little bit, putting, scraping paint over the top of that to get textural qualities both the physical dimension of the paint, but also to represent the texture of the, the subject itself. Um, and I really find the most enjoyable part of the process. Uh, just building up that paint is, a, is one of my favorite parts. Um, and in this case, that was my favorite part. When I, if I were to point to something that I was just really excited about, it was all of that sagebrush. You might look at that and go, oh my god, that's like three weeks worth of sagebrush painting. but. It was really just three weeks of creating interesting texture. That's what it came down to. So trials as an artist, collecting reference material, making a living, finding success. But I basically just say good luck. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's funny when you're when you're first starting out. This particularly, I'm sure this is goes towards artists in general, but in particularly with wildlife art. When you first start out, you don't have a catalog full of 100,000 plus reference image, images of animals, and you don't have tons of planar studies built up, and you, you don't have all of those experiences. And so while you may be great at drawing and such, your, your work as, early, as an early wildlife artist is no, in no way going to be as good as it is 10, 20 years down the road. It just can't be. And the reason for that, and certainly if you're trying to tell stories with your paintings like me, the reason for that is because as you accumulate all of that material, you generate new and interesting ideas, you find different ways of looking at things, and these are all things that you would never have thought of when you don't go out and you don't photograph. Um, we have a couple of artist friends whose careers I've noticed have really taken off, and it's largely due because they have been spending way more time in the field. At least that's how I attribute it to their success. Their work has just gotten that much better. Their insights are better. The, the stories they're telling are better. And it's largely due because they have amassed this mountain of material to draw from. Um, finding, finding animals, honestly, uh, you can do it two ways. You can spend, like me, 14 hours a day just driving in a circle around the park and hoping to stumble across something. That's usually the way it happens. Or you can do, like I do on occasion, you can hike for 14 hours a day and stumble across something. And either way, it's just as likely to find things. So a lot of times I like to just have snacks and eat and drive. So, um, no, it's not as glamorous as it sounds, but it's, uh, it's just part of the deal. Animals don't do what you want them to do, and so you have to go seek them out. And you can kind of make generalizations about where they may or may not be. Um, but once you find them, it's great because a lot of times, especially in the national parks, they're pretty tolerant of people, so you can just sit down and really study them and photograph them and, you know, bring your sketchbook and that kind of thing, so that's really nice. Um, making a living out of an artist, that's, uh, that's much more tricky. Um, <laughs> when I went into advertising, I thought, advertising is my day job, I'm going to paint 
in my off hours, build up a portfolio, take it to galleries, I'll be set, be no problem. But advertising decided to eat up 90 hours a week and I was completely mentally exhausted and never had time to actually sit down and really paint and really focus. So one day I just walked up to Yvonne, kind of tapped her on the back, Yvonne, I quit my job today. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we made a plan, basically. We had no debt. I didn't really own anything but my car. And so uh, I was able to save up a lot of money. I did well in advertising, and so I was able to save up at least a year's worth of expenses. And so we decided we found a place that was cheap to live. I was living, we were living in Phoenix at the time. And we said, hey, Nebraska's cheap, and it's in the middle of all the shows I want to do and places I want to go. So we moved to the middle of Nebraska. She did have family there, so she was much more okay with it than even I was. Um, and I spent the next four years there painting and doing shows and just toiling away. And what was interesting was, because I was able to focus on it full time, it was significantly easier to make a living at it uh, than I thought it was going to be. I made enough to keep doing it and keep going and keep getting better and keep doing more. Um, I was working really hard. At one point I was doing nine shows a year and many of those shows required 10 or 12 pieces for the show. And so, uh, so that was hard. It was a lot of late days and late nights. I had started out in pastel, exclusively worked in pastel. And so, you know, there was a lot of expenses involved and things like that, but just keeping my debt low was really the key, I think. I didn't, since I wasn't having to send money out to other people, I was able to put it back into my art. Um, and that made it a lot easier. And then I always think about it as a kind of graph where I'm okay, I'm good enough to make a living as an artist, but I keep getting better the more I paint, the more experiences I have, the more reference material I collect. And the whole time, People on this end are seeing more of my work, I'm doing more shows, I'm getting more exposure, and eventually they kind of collide in a way that you actually start making a, a living that you're comfortable with, that you're not going, okay, well, who, which electric bill am I paying this one? Maybe we can push that, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, that was really nice uh, when that occurred. And that was a little while ago now, and it's been good sense, thank goodness. I'm always still terrified to talk to my wife. It's gonna fall out, I just know it's gonna come crashing down. But, um, you know, just keep doing the best work you can and don't concern yourself too much with it, and I think it generally keeps moving along. Um, finding success. I, in my case, I wasn't the one necessarily that found success. That really was a product of other people. I can't stress, especially to other artists, how important it is to get to know people who run shows, get to know collectors, um, get to know magazine editors, gallery owners, because it's incredible the role they play in your career when you look back at it over time. I can sit down and pinpoint the exact paintings and the exact people who made big changes in my career and how that happened. And so it was just a kind of continual notches up. Uh, one thing, led, me doing one show led to me meeting this person, and she said, you need to do this show. In fact, Western Visions is very much how that happened. Uh, I was doing a show on the East Coast, and Lynn Fries happened to see my artwork. Said, enter the miniature show. And I did, and I got in, and so that was one step. And the next step was the Trailside Gallery. I saw my work at the miniature show here and invited me to be a part of the gallery. And these things just kept building. And eventually I was like so busy, I didn't know what to do, and I was making a living. So it was really nice in that regard. Um, and I think that's kind of, you have to focus on that. It's really, I get tons of rejection letters. I just received my latest pre to west rejection letter. So <laughs> you get them all the time, it's great. I mean, I'm down on the side and hey. Um, but now I don't, it doesn't bother me at all because I know it's just a part of the process. You just keep focusing on producing, producing better work. Um, and that's me as an artist. So that's all I have. So the next artist is uh, Amy Moore. Uh, oh, Amy, Terry. A, Lane Terry, or I don't remember 
or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a really skilled artist, and it uh, does work extraordinarily interesting, and which I love, which is why I asked her to do it. So, hey. In preparing for this, I tried to approach the topic of love and labor by separating words. Um, should I talk about the labor first, or should I talk about the love? And the more I tried to separate them, the more I realized I just couldn't. Um, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, I think, as an artist. Love is hard to define, and labor is really tough to talk about. Um, and I tell you about my labors, I don't want to sound negative, because I assure you, it'll be followed up with some love. Um, by definition, labor is work, especially hard physical work. Toil, grind, struggle to exert. Um, I've heard a few times in my life, not as a compliment, if you want to get Amy to do something, tell her not to. <laughs> this kind of sums up the source of much of the self-inflicted labor in my life. I was also told once, well, you're an artist, so there must be something wrong with you. Um, and I guess these are the statements that get under your skin and you continually re revisit them and analyze them throughout your life. Um, and over the years, I've kind of come up with my rebuttal. And that is this, I believe, that to be an artist means you have to cozy up to a certain degree of rebellion. I'll get back to that. Don't be scared. <laughs> My life as an artist uh, started quite early. Now I acutely know um, the things I'm going to tell you are critical to the career I now have. I'm probably going to talk about this a little more than um, my education, my art degree, any of that stuff because I think it ultimately had more of an effect. I come from a family of artistic types, and I was raised in a home which I can most easily describe to you as lovingly eclectic. Myself and my three brothers were lucky enough to spend our childhood on a magical piece of land in remote Northeast Oregon. That was homesteaded by our great-grandparents. So that came all the stories traditions, and of course, expectations of ranch life. My dad played the guitar and would read stories from history and wake us up in the morning, sometimes playing revelry on a bugle. Um, my mom recited Shakespeare, corrected our verbal grammar, and painted watercolors at the kitchen table. My family raised a huge garden and ran cattle and milked a few dairy cows, churned butter, <laughs> herded chickens and rabbits to stock the freezer with wild game canned everything, and kept life as simple and self-sufficed as possible. 
We were always covered in dirt. It <laughs> <laughs> um, was not a word. Um, but always having an animal near was vital. We were so happy. Um, I don't remember the moment when I realized this, but I guess I just knew. Life on the ranch meant witnessing um, both the joy of life and the sad death of wild things and tame things. And before I tell you this next part, um, I really want you to know I love animals. And I know it's not okay to keep wild animals in your mom's chicken coop or hide them in a cardboard box under your bed. <laughs> Varmints at the ranch were meant to be exterminated. The sound of a 22 rifle was common and almost sacred. My brothers would collect 10 cents a tail for every ground squirrel they could trap. Um, so back to the rebellion thing. I think this was the beginning of my rebellion. I made it my cause to save every little animal that I could. I had boxes of mice and so many baby starlings. Um, one time working coyote pups, we had a set of magpies or raven, songbirds, blackbirds, one time baby porcupines. I was going to save them all. And while it didn't always work, and my poor parents, um, I learned so much about animals. Things that are now prevalent and vital to my work. I learned how they were put together, how they move. I learned about the patterns of their fur and feathers and the colors, their expressions. I learned that they were worth it. So I began to draw them, and while my mom would paint at that kitchen table, I would too. Soon enough, I had realized my unique talent in the family of artists. I loved, more than anything, my best companion was his mom horse. Um, she was born on the ranch when my dad was 10, and she died at the very late age of 36, and is buried there. She was my babysitter. I miss her, and I paint her to this day. My motivation to become and to stay an artist. <laughs> I think my main motivation to become an artist was the love of the animal and my ability to honor that animal with the one thing I could really give them. I guess the thing nature gave me was my talent. And I think why I stay an artist is exactly the same reason, um, plus some stubbornness. <laughs> An undeniable feeling I've had my entire life is that I was supposed to do this. My hope today in sharing my story is to maybe inspire someone else to see that there are so many different paths to this beautiful career. I took a rough one, but a great one, that just seems to keep going. Um, there were times I felt very alone on my path. But the more I explored it, the less alone I became. My life and my family's worlds have been forever changed by this career. So many of the best friends of my life I've met on this path. I think when I was younger, honestly, uh, I think I just wanted it, I wanted it all. Um, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a female version of Indiana Jones. I wanted to be a mother. I wanted to have a great love in my life. I wanted to be a firefighter, a history teacher, and a rancher. I got to do all those things except Indiana Jones, one in first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did it all. I, I luckily, I got to do it all, but there was a price to be paid. The labor of wanting such lofty things made it difficult to devote the time I wanted early on to my career. I feel like for years I was just slowly growing um, and forming inside this artist I was going to become, and I was just gathering confidence and perspective, and I think probably still am. And other than just a handful of people, support for my dream to become a professional artist was pretty thin. I think maybe all artists have to learn to just ignore what I call the sideways look. It's that look you get when someone asks, what do you do for work? Um, you could be at a barbecue or a ball game, or a college advisor's office, or trying to get a bank loan, and you say, I'm an artist. <laughs> and it's that subtle turn of the head, look at you with one eyeball sideways thing. Um, 
There was a time in my life when it made my stomach hurt when that would happen. Um, because then I had to explain it and I had to say, yes, this, it, it really, really is a job and I'm really pretty normal. Um, but nowadays, nowadays when I get the sideways look, I just smile. Um, it feels good. That's the love. Um, for me, funding was so scarce. Early on, I was, my, I was on my own, and it's true, it takes money to make money. Um, having three kids and two careers early on now seems kind of insane. Most of the time, my kids traveled with me. Um, we ate and stayed as cheaply as possible. I would drive all night, um, stay up all night to paint, three car seats and the way back with my Jeep Cherokee loaded with paints, and we would drive nine hours to Jackson Hole. Um, but again, the love part, it bonded us and gave the kids this killer sense of adventure that is really working for them today as young adults. It took me 10 years to build my career, and until I could resign from, my teach, from teaching history and go full-time 100% with my art, um, that's what I had to do. It was frightening to give up such a steady thing. It was frightening. Um, when I decided to make the move, most of my friends and colleagues, they gave me that same sideways look out of love, <laughs> and told me, don't burn your bridges. So. I burned them to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Rebellion. Um, I know I didn't do it all perfectly. Starving artist was not just a cliche. As for the present, um, as for the present, the labors of this career are different now. Uh, my personal biggest labor is distraction. Um, there are just too many things in this world that are too beautiful and magical and I'm fascinated with. Other than that big thing, which is really just me, we work with wonderful galleries and clients, people's livelihoods. They do. They depend on us to be creative. Um, they depend on us to be reliable. Um, we are challenged to create something unique that we are proud of. And then, oh boy, it just sold. So now create another one that is better. Um, but make it similar, but not the same, and make sure it looks just like you, but hope no one tries to copy your style or idea that you have the same style. Think about getting right out. The labors. The love. Bring it on. For me, labor and love are also the driving forces why I and most of us are drawn to get better in our work. To keep pushing our talent, push our styles and our stamina, we strangely get addicted to the labor, and then the labor strangely becomes love. My process. Throughout my career, my evolving process has always had the element, once again, I think, of rebellion in it. When I started out painting exclusively in watercolor, I had a hard time eventually sticking to those rules. Watercolor is one of those mediums which has rules for a reason. Purity of the medium and the skill go hand in hand. I didn't follow the rules, and I knew the rules, because when I was 12, my mom remarried, and our professor, an accomplished watercolorist, pipe smoking, fiery, brilliant Scotsman who drank lots and lots of good wine and loved ABBA, <laughs> usually together. Um, and he was wonderful. He taught me how water and paint flow the importance of the basic pencil drawing. Violet and green love each other, and to try to be a purist to the medium. He was the closest thing I had to a mentor for my work. I'm so grateful for this foundation of looseness and organic simplicity. I've kept the same basic palette he laid out for me, keep it simple, mixed colors. Eventually, I wanted to work bigger, brighter, and more permanent, and my galleries greatly encouraged this. Um, and I was really tired of breaking glass. Um, I needed to move to oils. I eventually made the transition from watercolor to oil, and the reason I didn't do it sooner was mainly a loyalty to, to watercolor. Um, but also, I did not want to paint thick or lose my style. I wanted, I wanted, uh, 
the ephemeral flow, lines of wind and fire whispers of charcoal, it was important to me that my pencil lines were not only visible, but prominent, the bones of the painting. For me, the drawing is still the most sacred. So in my mind, in order to preserve my style, I decided not to learn oils from anyone. No YouTube videos, no workshops, no traveling, studying great masters in amazing places. I decided to be my own experiment, rebellion. So I bought some paint and solvent and treated it exactly like a watercolor and it worked. I found out it's still just pigment and liquid. There's no rules. And the possibilities multiply for me with oils. I didn't have to lose anything. I just had to do, I just had to follow my gut. And that's the love. I work loosely and quickly using pencil, charcoal, and a thin oil wash followed by select layers of thicker paint for the pal, I guess. I use the white of the canvas like the white of watercolor paper. I try to keep my reference material very minimal, which I know sounds weird in a lot of the world. Um, I greatly admire my fellow artists who are also expert photographers. I think it's part of being multi-talented. I realize that photography is not one of my talents. <laughs> the cameras I break, I get too distracted. Um, and I don't like having a camera between me and nature. I just feel like it's in my way. I find myself more curious about the way an animal moves and, and behaves. Um, if I get more of a mental film reel, um, a mental snapshot, then that works for me better. I think it goes back to that childhood goal of I should be able to draw from memory, which is weird. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just a stubborn thing, I guess. Um, and if I'm not dependent on a photo, I can pose or draw out my subject for me more creatively. Um, the most beautiful works in history for me are the ones that are crafted with a mental snapshot as far as inspiration. Lascaux and Altamira Caves are my top of the heap inspirational works. Um, simplicity and drama, charcoal line, movement, pigment, and for those mysterious artists, love of those animals. It shows. I'm so in awe of early wildlife masters in this museum as well, who had nothing to rely on but their memory and maybe just a sketchbook. They, to me, have such a signature brand with the, way they, with the way they drew an animal. They had a unique individual style. They were not anatomically perfect. They were exaggerated in places dependent on the artist's mind and mood. Um, this is the direction that inspires me. Where my style is not realism, maybe more, um, I don't, I've never known what I'm supposed to call it because I don't think I'm supposed to name it myself. But maybe more expressionism or impressionism, I'm not sure. I have, though, endless room to play. Um, why wildlife art? Okay. It never gets old, but yet it is so old. It was really the first subject we made art. Um, the precedent was set, and maybe those who create wildlife art are simply following this primal heartbeat. I look back at what humans have been drawn to. What is the one subject that we have been emulating, honoring, worshiping for thousands of years? Before written language, we carved and painted wild animals, and when we did start to create language, their likenesses were adopted in our symbols. Um, they cover our monuments. They've been proudly carried into battle. And civilizations were named for them, and it still goes on from wall art living rooms and coffee shops to the symbols of our stock market. We all have our many spirit animals, um, to sports teams, to women's fashion. Um, antlers and feathers are everywhere, and leopard print and swallow print and bee stuff. I mean, it's, we wear it all the time. For me, though, with all of this, the rub is how can a species like us who is worshipped and relied so heavily on wildlife and the animal who is so thrived in advance because of the animal, um, so neglected. Allow it to disappear. When I'm asked, why are you a wildlife artist? Honestly, 
It's least about following a dream and doing what I love. As true as those things are and were, they end up sounding a bit selfish to me the older I get. The more I feel the need to find a larger purpose for why I paint, it's more about helping these beautiful creatures, I think. Like when I was that little girl, I guess, my new box of starlings under my bed is keeping them relevant, sacred. Let's make them more popular. If I, if we, can paint them, present them in a beautiful way that helps get them into perhaps the hearts and homes of people, um, all ages and all, all types of people, let's get animal art more out there. Let's keep something unique and one of the kinds, animal and art, alive. This is the love. Maybe we all do this. But the first time I visited this museum, as I walked through, I knew I was in a sacred place. What these artists in this collection here um, have given the world is pure magic. I found a special piece and I sat with it. What happened to me with this piece, the way it made me feel the power generated, um, I will always keep sacred. When I come here to this day, I find a quiet time to slip away, and I sit with that piece. Western Visions has given us, um, this group of artists, the opportunity to create two examples of our own unique Western vision. It's truly our honor, this National Museum of Wildlife, Wildlife Art. This beautiful concept gives us all this magic. I'm so grateful it's here. Um, it promotes society and nature to coexist. So I'm very proud to be a part of it, and thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Andrew Dennett. Thank you, Amy, very much for that. Um, that's me. My name's Blair. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Andrew Denman, and I'm going to be um, talking to you about my work, but within the context of a broader topic, which is contemporary wildlife art. So I thought this would be an appropriate thing to talk about because um, within this group of artists, there are people that um, I consider to be contemporary wildlife artists. And I should clarify, I realize that those of us who are artists in this room who are alive are, of course, contemporary because we're living. Um, and, and so I know it's a little bit of a, of a clunky term, but um, for the sake of being able to talk about what I consider to be sort of a subset of the broader picture of wildlife art, I'm gonna use this term for its convenience. But to begin with, I want to talk about um, a little bit about wildlife art and its beginnings. Um, and uh, Amy touched on this really beautifully. Um, but I'm speaking, uh, I should clarify, I'm speaking specifically about painting. Um, because particularly when it comes to the influence of the contemporary, the story of how that happens in sculpture is actually very different from how it happens in painting. Um, so I'm going to talk about painting in particular. So, you know, it's interesting because, yeah, um, as Amy said, um, wildlife has been with us uh, as, a, as a subject for art and symbology for a very, very long time. But wildlife art as sort of a group, a movement, a community is something that's not that old. Um, that uh, really begins with science illustration, sporting art, and into the um, sort of uh, middle of the 20th century, what I refer to as sort of an ecological art, which is where artists begin painting an animal in its environment, behaving naturally, um, but without the sporting component. You know, there's no one, uh, there's, it's, it's not necessarily an animal that anyone is uh, intending to shoot or hunt. It's uh, simply the animal painted for the animal's sake and to tell you a story about it, um, the sort of narrative that, uh, that Dustin was talking about. 
Um, what all of these things have in common is a documentarian aspect. Um, and that, uh, that notion of going out and reporting, seeing, and sharing what we've seen. And again, I think that's something that whatever style we're working in as artists, whether it's more traditional, more contemporary, or something in between, whatever traditional and contemporary mean, frankly, um, that uh, we're always trying to share an experience that we've had and give it to other people. Um, but for most of the history of Wild That Far, again, as a community of group of artists, I hesitate to call it a genre because it's really a subject choice that transcends a lot of different genres. Um, the uh, narrative has typically been a natural historical narrative. Not always, certainly, but typically it has been. So what do I talk about when I'm talking about contemporary wildlife art? Well, the, the shorthand is I'm simply talking about people who paint wildlife, but who paint wildlife introducing elements that typically the broader art world considers as belonging to contemporary or modern art. So we're talking about things like abstraction, um, like in this piece, um, elements in the background, for instance, that do not correspond to an objective reality. This is uh, nuthatches like doilies. They might. <laughs> <laughs> um, stylization, which we should distinguish from abstraction in that the subject matter is still recognizable, but elements of it are drawn out, pulled, pushed into less representational forms but they're still representational in that they're still representing a subject. So for instance, the stylization of the, of the leaves uh, and the bulb on this site, uh, Morellus, which sort of explode into kind of an Art Nouveau treatment in this uh, painting of mine. Uh, flatness and pattern is a big one. Um, this is part of my modern camouflage series, and I'm gonna be talking about that a lot more later on. Um, Non-objective space and color. This is another really huge one and something that I think really distinguishes certain uh, artists within the wildlife art movement from others, the contemporary from the non-contemporary, um, and that is um, the removal of an animal subject from its natural environment and the recontextualizing of that animal subject. Um, so taking an animal out of the space that we know it in and presenting it in a different environment uh, forces the viewer to consider the animal subject in a different light. Another way to recontextualize is with non-objective color. So this is the blue bunny. Um, and again, we know bunnies aren't blue, but when you take an animal subject and you, and you change something, you torque something like color, again, it causes the um, viewer to look at that um, animal in a different uh, light. And one of the things that almost all, first of all, I, don't, I want to make very sure that as I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm speaking about where my experiences have led me and what I like to focus on my art, not to denigrate artists who are working in what I consider to be a more traditional wildlife art paradigm, because it's that wildlife art that caused me initially to fall in love with wildlife art. Um, and many of the artists who are sitting here represent that. Many of the artists sitting here represent people that I think are more part of my sub-movement. Um, but uh, that's probably a, I liked when Amy said it's not really up to her to call what she does anything in particular because that's something that someone else will do later on. So who knows whether the, the, the moniker contemporary wildlife art will hold, it probably won't. Um, but uh, looking back, some of them will decide how to group us all and categorize. But, um, so all art has a concept, of course. But um, just as you'll notice it in sort of, if you go into a modern art museum, you go to the Tate Modern, there's a dramatic emphasis on concept. Sometimes, I think, to the extent that everything else is sacrificed in favor of concept, <coughs> like craft or it being attractive, uh, which is something I try to avoid. But nonetheless, um, all of my work, the, the concept is something that is always very paramount. There's a, there's a narrative, there's a story behind the piece, but instead of a natural historical narrative that's so much about the animal, however much the animal was integral to the original inspiration, the narrative is more about the manner in which I painted it, something internal that's happening in me. In this case, this particular painting is really about the act of painting. You know, the, the tiger, you can't really see it in this, in this um, image, is half of it's a pencil drawing, half of it's a finished painting. It's walking through a bunch of paint cans, the colors are bleeding up into the animal. The tail of the peacock is turning into paint chips. Um, this was a commission, so every one of the colors is named for something personally relevant to every member of the family of the commissioner. It was a really cool piece. But there's a big story happening there. So that notion of concept as being a paramount element is, I think, really, really important to me personally, but also important within the broader context of what I'm going to, again, refer to as contemporary wildlife art. 
Um, so my career started really, really early. Um, from the time I was 13 years old, I started going into Pacific Wildlife Galleries in Lafayette, California and hassling the owner to show my work. And uh, at that age, that wasn't going to happen. And uh, Dennis Saville, who owned that gallery, was um, an absurdly laconic figure. Um, he, he didn't like to talk a lot. And uh, rather than the lavish praise that I was getting heaped on me at the time as you know, the art guy um, in my small town I grew up in, um, I got sort of like, mm, <laughs> kind of nods. And that really was exactly what I needed because I'd go back and I'd show more work and I'd get a slightly more encouraging nod. And I'd go back to where I might get a hum, you know, and then eventually, uh, by the time I was 16, I actually had paintings on the wall. Uh, paintings on the wall hanging next to Bob Bateman's, um, Carl Brenner's, John Street Lester. So I was 16 at that time and I was hanging with the people that I'd been looking at their books since I was a little kid. So um, it was a really heady time for me. This is me at my first show, my first one-man show at that gallery, which was um, like five months after I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts. So I was 21, I think, um, 20 or 21. So um, being surrounded by all these artists and having met people like John and Bob from a very, very young age, um, you know, all of them I stay in touch with, many of them I consider to be mentors, um, a lot of the artists that I've, that I've exhibited with at Pacific Wildlife Galleries, it's no wonder that my earliest forays into wildlife art were very much within that paradigm of mid to late 20th century ecological wildlife art, animal, in environment, behaving naturally. But I was also young and I was experimental and I went to college and I was trying lots of different things and I was really tickled to hear Dustin talk about um, fantasy art because that was one of my first loves as well. I went through a whole, you know, monster dragon dinosaur phase. Um, and uh, so I was doing lots of different things. And I had a real breakthrough when I was in college. Um, this is before they told me that I could just be on independent study and do whatever I wanted to do where um, we were asked to do a knife painting, and I'd never done uh, an impasto work at all. I'd never used a palette knife before except to mix paint. So um, I did this big, scratchy, sloppy knife painting, which everyone else moved over and I thought was crap. And at the time, they were really emphasizing at the college I was at, it's a small Catholic liberal arts college, St. Mary's in, in Moraga, California, they really emphasized doing things like building your own canvases from scratch. So I had a lot of work just in this canvas didn't want to throw it away, but I was used to painting on a flat surface. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to just remove the canvas and put a new canvas on, but it didn't. Um, so what I did instead was I took a whole bunch of gesso and I coated over this heavy, gloppy canvas and did coat after coat after coat until I sort of filled in some of the cracks and valleys. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to sand this puppy smooth, sand down all the ridges and then, and then even it out. And what happened when I did that is that I got this field of white with all these beautiful, dark, patterns emerging from it as I sanded down those ridges. I thought it was really evocative, it was very abstract. It kind of looked like when you look out the wing of a plane flying over the Rockies and you see the little black ridges emerging through the snow. I glazed over it with a bunch of color transparently so you can still see all the patterns and plunked a bird in the middle of it. And the effect was sort of like a bird flying through a nebula. And that was the very first of my Resurrection of Flight series, so-called because it was sort of like giving new life to what I considered to be a bad painting. And for many years, any time I felt like I really botched something, I would just throw a bunch of whatever extra paint I had at that board, gesso over it, sand it down, and whatever that gave me, my job was to sort of find a way to make that work as a non-objective space in which to house a bird in flight. So this was the <laughs> fifth and last of the Resurrection of Flight series. Um, now, uh, that notion of applying really thick impasto paint, gessoing over it and sanding it down is something that at the, that time I didn't know would become integral to my artistic process and is now uh, probably accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of every painting is done in that manner. Um, and now it's done in a very controlled, directed way, but it still has very much the same sort of happy accident quality that watercolor has, where you know there's certain things between that applying it, painting over it, sanding it down, all sorts of things happen that I have very little control over, which is why it's exciting to do. Um, so this uh, piece I'm going to show you, this is called Indigo. Um, this is a big painting of um, Indian blue peafowl. And this is a breakthrough piece for me, I think it was from 2002 because this was the very first piece where I didn't just use this technique for an abstract um, or non-objective background, I allowed for that treatment to bleed over into the animal subjects themselves. 
So the main, the central peacock is very realistic, except for the tail, which bleeds into this stylization and abstraction. And the peacock in the back, if you, when you cut the head off, it almost doesn't resemble a peacock at all. Yet within the context of the painting, it does. So I could talk to you a whole lot about my process, and I actually really thought about doing like a time lapse thing, and I, I was just really try not to laugh when Dustin was talking about that because like I have the exact same experience. You you record like the blocking and like this is really cool, it looks so awesome. And you're like, how do I film myself working on this for the next 80 hours? <laughs> like how? Like it's it's you know it's watching paint dry. So um, and, and moreover I feel like um, you know to a certain extent as much as like my process is very personal and I love it and I don't mind sharing how I work and if you want to see videos of me plotting random things you can find them on my YouTube channel. Knock yourself out. I'm working on a couple more at the moment, actually, that I'm going to post soon. I enjoy doing that, but um, you know, talking to you here now, I feel like it's just so much more important to talk about ideas than it is about the physical process of hashing out a painting. Um, so, art history from the mid late uh, the mid late 1800s to the 20th century. Um, one of the biggest questions that happens within that context is this one: Is the canvas a window or a wall? Do we as artists treat the canvas or the board or whatever you're working on with Renaissance perspective as a, a space to be credibly entered into, a window on the world, as in this fairly old landscape painting of mine? Or do we treat it as a flat surface to be decorated? And this is a detail of one of my modern camouflage pieces. I know it looks like wallpaper, and yes, that is the point. <laughs> so, This story kind of begins, um, it's a long story, but it really starts with um, Manet. Um, this is the famous Luncheon on the Grass. Uh, sorry, there should be a date up there. It's um, 1862, I believe. This is, so Manet is one of the first artists that really starts to eschew Renaissance perspective. This painting was panned at the time it was first exhibited because it was considered to be sort of a hodgepodge, like he had pasted together a bunch of different elements. The perspective doesn't really work. The gentleman's coats are just sort of these black voids. They look very flat. The, the depth with the figure in the background doesn't quite make sense. There's too much space for it to be that big. All of these things are deliberate, and uh, Manet is particularly is trying to play with the sense of, of depth and your expectation of depth on what is effectively a flat surface. Um, this is uh, Matisse's The Red Studio from 1911, and this is where you really start to see this notion of, of, of the treatment of the board or the canvas is flat, really um, coalescing. There is, in the line, in the drawing work, some suggestion of perspective in the depth of the room, but it's obliterated by the painting of the entire thing in one color, and that's very deliberate. Matisse was being inspired by um, Persian miniatures in particular at this time. Now, of course, I get, I'm, I'm giving a very, very um, brief history of kind of how this notion, this conflict within art started. Um, and I don't want to make this an art history lesson, but we can just say that this moves forward to things like abstract expressionism, minimalism, none of which would be possible without some of these early artists first just barely showing you the, uh, that they're playing with this notion of uh, flatness. Um, so, curiously, one of the areas in art that inspired me to explore this on my own terms were the um, American Trump Lloyd painters um, like William Harnett, uh, John Haverly, John F. Pajo. This is one of the After the Hunt paintings by Harnett from 1884. And what really intrigued me about these pieces, I mean, first of all, I, I encountered these when I was in fifth grade. I had a great fifth grade teacher who introduced us to a different American artist every week. And I saw a huge Harnett retrospective at the Dion Museum in San Francisco when I was in my early teens, I think, and I never forgot it. And, you know, the magic of these artists painting ordinary objects, their actual size, um, so as to convince you that you were looking at the actual object itself in real space, not a representation of the object. It's sort of the, the ultimate in, um, in illusionism. But what really intrigued me is that one of the things that these artists did is that they painted very shallow depth of field. So that when you enter a room and you look at, say, a painting of a landscape, as you turn and shift, you can obviously tell it's a flat surface because the perspective distorts as you walk around it. Less so when the artist is only trying to convince you that you're seeing a couple of inches or almost a foot of depth. So, ironically, the most convincing illusions of depth created by the Trompe artists were reliant upon 
on a very convincing duplication of surface, um, a door, a bulletin board, a letter wrap. So then I thought to myself, well, what if I painted uh, an abstract painting, a color field painting, and then layered on top of it objects, which again I would paint in trompe l'oeil detail complete with cast shadows, and in so doing, paradoxically reassert the abstract painting, the ultimate in treatment of the surface as flat, as an illusionistic surface within a perceptible depth range. And so I just thought, that's a cool concept. I can do, I can get some paintings out of that. So I did a whole series of these. This is actually the very last of those um, still life paintings. But that was just a concept that really intrigued me. And I talk about it now because it sort of brings us to one of the things I'm really focusing on today. So um, Gertrude Stein once said, there is no repetition, there is only insistence, which is a line that I really, really like. Um, and you have to keep that in mind if you actually read any Gertrude Stein, because you're crazy if you don't. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is uh, part of my what I call my modern camouflage series. So I had this idea in my head for maybe two or three years of um, owls emerging from wallpaper. And um, I was hesitant to start it because my, my problem was well, how, how is it not going to be jarring to have realistically painted owls and then this completely flat surface? How do they integrate? How do they work together? And what I eventually realized was that the very fact that they don't is the point. And that where they do, it can be done in a very minimal way. So um, in these paintings, you can see in this detail, there's just the tiniest little area where there's a suggestion of a shadow on a flat um, pattern or a, a claw curling around it, or actually like there's a little bit of a cast shadow there. So just a few inches to the left or right, this pattern becomes exactly what it is, which is a completely flat pattern. But somehow the flat surface is animated by its juxtaposition with the illusion, illusionistically treated elements. Um, so that uh, idea really intrigued me. And bringing it forward um, to what I'm working on at the present, um, this notion of pattern is something that um, is one that you'll see a lot of in, in pop art and op art. Um, and oddly, I don't actually like pop art or op art, but they've been so prevalent in, in our society, they've had such an impact, they've worked their way into me, and I'm finding my own way to express some of these ideas in a way that I think is more pleasing than, for instance, Andy Warhol's Immortal Soup Cans, but you gotta give the guy credit. Um, we're still looking at it today, and they're Campbell soup cans. <laughs> so um, this is another piece. This is uh, uh, Wayne Tebow on um, the Folsom Street Fair Cake. He did a lot of these very regimented paintings of desserts primarily. Um, and what these pieces share in common is this, is this um, using an artistic medium to express and to explore commerciality, repetition. Um, this really intrigues me. Um, and then moving it on to a slightly different level, um, I was really, really excited that um, Amy talked quite a bit about sort of animal symbology. These are all common logos that you know, we see that appropriate animal imagery. Um, there's a really interesting book that I read not long ago by Carol Yoon called Naming Nature. And it's basically about the history of binomial nomenclature, which sounds really dry, but it's not. So, um, so basically, um, yeah. So that system of Latin naming, um, prior to that, every community, you know, from uh, you know, Aboriginal um, tribes to um, people living in the you know, jungles of, of the rainforest in South and Central America, they had what were referred to as folk taxonomies. So if you lived within a small patch of forest, say, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few hundred acres, you knew the names, they were your names, but you knew them nonetheless, of every plant and animal in your immediate area. You knew what you could eat, you knew what you couldn't eat, you knew what you could eat you, you knew what, what tasted good, you knew what was gross, you knew what you could use for skins, you know, all of that. Um, very detailed information. Um, when, uh, so binomial nomenclature is necessitated by, you know, originally like Captain Cook bringing stuff from all over the globe, and suddenly your understanding of birds exploded from birds that are in my backyard to similar birds that exist all over the world, to different birds. How do I categorize those? How do I put them together? We needed a system to do that. But originally you didn't have a system, you just had your own folk understanding. And the reason that the nomenclature is necessary is because it's fairly scientifically well documented that there's actually a limited amount of dedicated brain space to names of things. We can keep in our brain with immediate recall some, I, I, I'm 
don't quote me on this, but I think it's somewhere around 2,000 names of things. And what's happened is that as we have disassociated ourselves from nature, as we pulled ourselves away from nature, we're not really keeping these folk taxonomies in our brains because we don't need to, because you're not encountering things that can kill you and that you need to eat, you need to know what's poisonous every day. Instead, our heads are being filled up with brand names, logos, this kind of imagery, or worse, these horrible little icons in our phones. <laughs> and as you can see up here, I'm, I'm looking at one, two of these that still have the barest resemblance to something that is an actual objective external reality. Um, most of these things are not. And I know this is going to make me sound terribly old, I'm only 40, but kids today. Um, their brains, the brain space that was once dedicated to a knowledge of nature is now completely filled with this sort of abstracted, um, and it's worse too because these are abstractions that stand for abstractions. How do you define Yahoo? You know, and, and, and what are we using to describe Yahoo? A Y, which is also an abstraction. You know, so it's, it's, um, it's something that I decided I need to explore that concept within art. So um, I did a show last year at Astoria Fine Art, which is my wonderful gallery that I'm really thrilled to be with here in Jackson Hole, called The Different Animal. And among the things I explored in that show were um, the notion of mass production, as in my chicken and egg series, very accessible chickens. Uh, ubiquity, really fascinated by animals like ravens, for instance, that are around us all the time, so much so that they become sort of background noise. Um, and you'll notice that there is a very deliberate sort of suggestion in the palette of um, Andy Warhol's soup cans and this raven. That's not accidental. I also think there's something flag-like about it. It's kind of like Burka. Um, I don't know why, but I, I get that feeling, even though it's actually lavender blue and black and red instead of red, white, and blue, but you get the idea. Uh, reproductive capacity. Um, this piece uh, is... Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> this is, this is a, a piece sort of exploring, um, uh, it's, it's called Multiplication Tables, um, and uh, it's exploring the rabbit. And again here we have also the, um, the non-object of color adding to this, um, you know, bringing sort of uh, allusions to the Christian Easter, or if you prefer the pagan Yostre into the whole thing, this notion of um, death, life, rebirth, <clears throat> reawakening, etc., that uh, in sort of a whimsical and cheeky way the rabbit represents. Uh, and right now, um, I've, I've just shipped off a show to England where I'm exploring these same sort of uh, uh, topics of, of pattern and repetition, but with uh, mostly British heritage livestock. So um, there's also a series I'm working on, which kind of brings us right back to where I started with modern camouflage. Uh, these are both part of my string theory series. And um, I'm sort of playing around with, uh, you know, again, what are effectively flat color fields, kind of reminiscent of like a 1960s Barnett Newman zip painting, um, but the just barest points of contact between the recognizable animal subjects and these flat areas of color immediately takes two-dimensional shapes and colors and makes them alive and animate within three-dimensional space. And that to me is something that's really magical and exciting. Um, and these are very deliberately stripped down paintings, but uh, and because oftentimes less is more. But for any of you know, who know uh, Randy Dutra, a dear friend of mine, he once said, and I'll never forget it, they say that less is more, but you know, sometimes less is less. <laughs> so it, it is important within this context to be careful about how far you push lessness. So um, another um, thing that's really inspired me um, is religious imagery. So this uh, is a um, piece by William Strath from 1896. Not a particularly well-known artist, but this is 100% his most well-known image. It pretty much made his career. Um, an old lithograph of this painting uh, hung in my grandparents' um, house when I was a kid. And this was, I can't emphasize how this was the most unkid-friendly house on the planet. You'd walk in there, and within minutes, my older brother and my grandpa would be playing cribbage. And all I would hear was <coughs> of the clock. 
and I'm just sitting there like, what, you know, what, what is there here for me? And uh, the two things was the collection of uh, red rose um, ceramic tea animals in a little curio cabinet, um, a plastic Noah's Ark, which was missing all of the animals, <laughs> um, and this painting, which I would stare at for hours. And I know my grandmother thought I was having some sort of religious experience with baby Jesus and the animals, um, but really I was just fascinated by the animals themselves and also by this in the background, which is actually like an angel, but um, I thought it was a dragon. <laughs> I read these as like big ears and a mountain smoke coming out, I don't know why. Um, anyway, so, um, but I, I thought about it and this is really probably the very first experience that I had with wildlife art with animals in the context of a painting. Um, and then this you'll all recognize um, as uh, Albert Durer's Immortal a Young Hare, which is you know, still considered one of the, the finest, very early explorations of, of an animal um, subject in painting. And of course, you know, Durer was um, a religious painter. This is not a religious subject, but I think that he carries through the reverence he had for his religious subjects into the reverence he has for nature in this piece. And that's really what I want to talk about in this next little, little section. Um, there's a, a sort of body of work I've done for a long time, which I refer to as, as animal icons. And uh, this particular piece actually is part of the permanent collection here at the museum. Um, and it's sort of my answer to Albert Durer's The Young Hare. It's called Michelle's Magic Bunny after a, a hike that I took with a friend of mine named Michelle, um, where we encountered this black-tailed jackrabbit that just sat there and posed for me. And as you know, jackrabbits don't do that. It was so bizarre, I was starting to think there was something wrong with it before it finally hopped off, but it was a very sort of spiritual, Aww. you know, animal in the church of nature kind of experience. <laughs> and I don't want to be glib about that, because I'm very serious. Um, but it was something that just demanded to be painted. Um, this is a drawing where I'm sort of exploring um, sort of some of the uh, notions of um, falcons in, in Egyptian iconography. This uh, um, uh, graphite and neuro pencil with um, gold leaf. Um, this was the sort of banner image from my national touring show, Modern Wild, uh, which Dave Wagner put together a few years ago. Um, and uh, at the time, I was still teaching some um, teenage students, and I was really tickled when like a 12-year-old student came in my studio and said, hey, dig your crucified bird. I was like, yes, <laughs> I'm communicating. Um, and uh, this was a bird that had flown into the window, actually, of the gallery that represented me at the time. And I just thought it was something that was so beautiful that I needed to pay homage to it. And I chose to house it in this context, um, really as sort of um, positioning it as, um, you know, suffering for our sins. You know, the bird had every right to be there. It's the window that they wanted to shoot mm -hmm. in. Um, and then this piece, um, which is called Icon, which I've not exhibited yet, um, but uh, painted a couple years ago, where um, I'm, uh, I, I come across this vervet monkey with infant when I was in Africa, um, and uh, it was just such a poignant experience, I really wanted to, to share it, and felt that I needed to house it in a context that showed the kind of reverence I had for the experience. And uh, in this piece, I feel like, um, you know, the, uh, the little vervet infant sort of becomes uh, a savior of an imperiled natural world. And I want to make it very clear with these pieces that I'm never intending to parody people's religious faith with these. I hope they come across as being as sensitive and um, serious as I intend them to be. Um, what I'm doing instead is taking a shared cultural, religious, spiritual, visual language, something that's instantly recognizable, and using it as a tool to communicate the reverence that I feel for the animal subject. That's what these pieces are about. Um, so what I've been focusing on lately, along with my pattern pieces, are totems. And again, this is another example of where there's a wonderful tradition in the American Pacific Northwest of using animals and stacking them in this way, but using them to communicate not so much information about the animal, but um, to use them as symbols for elements of ourselves, um, the way that we see ourselves. Do we associate with an eagle? Do we associate with a bear? Um, do we feel some kinship with the fox? Um, these are, are, are the, uh, the thoughts at play here. Um, so this is a piece, uh, a bronze by Tony Hochstetler called Stacked Frogs, which you may be familiar with. Um, 
this piece by Peter Wojtek, who I really admire, but don't know personally, but um, he does a lot of these amazing sort of gravity-defined, tension-filled stacks of found objects, fruit, and birds. And uh, these two artists are really the ones that inspired me to pursue the Totem series because I saw within these works artists who work very differently than I do, not just because they're sculptors, but just the look of their work is completely different from what I go for, but um, I love their work, I own a few Tonys. Um, and I just thought this, this inspired me to, like if they can reinterpret the Totem and put it into a 20th century or 21st century context, um, within wildlife art, so can I. So I decided to do that within the context of painting. Um, so these assemblages of animals are obviously meant to be fantastical. Uh, they're meant to be a bit whimsical. They're meant to be a bit quirky. Um, and again, I'm taking the animals out of their wild context and putting them into a very different context quite deliberately. Again, uh, by taking something that is very commonplace and recognizable and recontextualizing it, I'm hoping that the viewer will um, appreciate the animal and look at it in a different light um, than they would otherwise. Um, these are very labor-intensive pieces because um, although the, they are not intended to be realistic, they have their own sort of internal logic um, this is my most recent one, which is called Teton Totem. So I'm trying to sort of take all the animals that are most emblematic of the Tetons and, and stack them again in this, in this totem format. Um, but, you know, trying to get the scale right in a piece like this, where I've never seen, I've never photographed any one of these animal subjects in the context of the other, was really, really challenging. And then, of course, um, every leg and every foot has to be completely redrawn because obviously I was photographing them surface is very different than each other's backs. Um, and ultimately, these pieces are sort of meant to be commentaries on the sort of precarious state of ecosystems and environments, and um, they are taken out of those environments, again, to, to emphasize that, that point, um, that we're looking at them in sort of the context of our own lives. And again, I hope that, you know, if, you, if you're looking at these stacked animal paintings, you can, you can find yourself where, where do you fall in the stack? Are you the one on the bottom or the one on the top? Are you the one carrying everyone else or the one with the view? So in conclusion, um, I, uh, if you'll forgive the visual symbology of the bird and momentum, um, I feel like uh, you know contemporary wildlife art, contemporary influence within wildlife art is something that is really gaining momentum. At the time that I first started exhibiting really contemporary wildlife pieces um, in the you know early to mid 90s, um, I could count on one hand the artists that I was aware of working within wildlife art who were doing what I consider to be contemporary work, and most of them were sculptors. I could think of maybe two painters. Um, and when I started showing, I, I got a lot more acceptance than I thought I would. But there's a difference between acceptance and applause. And um, I think what's happening now is that, particularly in the last five to eight years, I'm really seeing a greater acceptance for a, a greater popularity for contemporary aspects of wildlife art. And frankly, the National Museum of Wildlife Art is a big part of that. So I'm really, really pleased to see. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be a part of this collection. Thrilled and honored to be a part of Western Visions um, and, and to continue to see more and more pieces added to this collection and more and more artists within Western Visions who are working um, in a, um, a paradigm that is, uh, is distinctly different from, however derived from, you know, wildlife art and its, uh, and its beginnings. Um, and uh, so with that, I'd uh, just like to thank you for your attention and uh, yeah, turn things over. So our next speaker is uh, September Vey, who is uh, another amazing Western Visions artist. Um, also has some incredible work at Altamira. If uh, you're wandering about town, that's a place to go to find her. And. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to turn things over to her and also ask you to join me in wishing her a happy birthday. Um, hello everybody, thank you for coming out. Um, this is a hard act to follow. Such an incredible artist, it's an honor to be here amongst this group. Um, 
I'm going to start. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to. It's, it's interesting to hear so many parallels between um, Amy and uh, Justin and Andrew. And I. One of the, the, the threads is a love of nature and a love of art and of spending a lot of time with animals. I think that's why um, all of us are here, is just a love for the wildlife and animals in general, domestic and um, the wild. And, um, and then I, it's uh, interesting to see different people's backgrounds and how people are influenced, and uh, not only by nature, and, um, but by their families and their external um, influences. So, um, I, um, my personal background is growing up around art and architecture, and uh, my journey is a little bit through architecture and into art, and uh, I didn't really realize um, that I would be an artist, and so here I am. Um, I'm a painter. It wasn't my plan, but um, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, so, in, in going through journals, I was thinking about this talk, and going through um, all of my journals from when I was a little girl to my current um, uh, group of body of work. And when I was little, I loved to draw and drew horses all the time. And I found, and I, I, I wish I had a slide of this, but I don't. Uh, but I, I did bring um, this book that I think um, a lot of people from um, this generation um, will, or from my generation will recognize, it's Wesley Dennis. Um, so he did, he was a famous, um, this was a book that a lot of young people, um, let's see, I think it was written in, it was done in the, um, in the um, 60s. And um, I spent a lot of time studying his work when I was like 10. Um, and um, just fell in love with how this person could uh, paint horses. So I think my first love was of horses and the nature. And um, so, I grew up around um, uh, architecture and art. Um, I was a fourth, I studied architecture in school and um, so grew up around um, conversations of structure and aesthetics. And um, my uh, mother was a painter. My great grandfather was a sculptor, a very famous sculptor. So we grew up not only around discussions about art and architecture, but around his paintings and his sculptures. So um, we would walk up to, I uh, just, just around the dinner tables and look at how he, um, discuss how he approached paintings and, um, um, and a lot of the sculptures were in my grandma's home. And so I spent a lot of time studying those paintings. Um, and so not only did I grow up around it, it was, there was a level of nurture around art and architecture. We were always encouraged to draw. We spent a lot of time in museums. Um, there was, a, when we built our house when I was a kid, there was, um, we were, the kids were all part of the process. Where did you want your rooms? How did the entryways go? Right, we're gonna um, go about, what is the experience that people have stepping through um, three-dimensional space? So my point with this is that I grew up thinking about three-dimensional space and animals and art and nature kind of all gone together. And um, I think um, my most impressionable, well, there are a lot of things that were um, strong impressions, but um, I think it would have to be in nature. So um, I grew up um, on a ranch, and um, when I, we moved out there when I was um, in high school, freshman in high school. But grew up on a ranch, and then also when we were, um, my sister and I were in uh, elementary school, um, we spent our summers on farms in, uh, uh, my grandparents' farm in northern Seattle, or northern Washington, Seattle, north of Seattle. And um, I think about those days, it's really interesting thinking about Amy and talking about um, animals. We'd just be out all day on our ponies um, looking um, at nature and just remember all those little times of being fascinated by how um, leaves would interact with, um, with the trees and studying the colors when they changed. And those are just um, times that um, Andrew touched on this, that kids these days are so removed from um, that much contact with nature. I think it's so important, and I think that's one thing that this museum does for people, is it connects people with nature, and they can see all these beautiful paintings, and then they'll go out in nature and enjoy it, and um, have a different, um, it'll, it'll mean more to them. So, and as far as preservation is concerned as well, that this museum encourages 
um, the protection of, of the wild places and wild animals in those places. Um, so um, my personal path, here's a little bit of some of these slides. Oops. Um, so there's a little bit of a um, uh, transition from architecture to art. And um, let's see. So this is a really early um, sketch, and it was from college. I spent a lot of time in Europe traveling um, and studying architecture. I spent a year, six months in Copenhagen, and six months traveling through Europe, and um, did a lot of drawing. And that's one of the things I learned um, that are relevant to my art is uh, a background in architecture. And um, in architecture, I learned um, to see things in three dimensional in three dimensions, and think through their function and. Um, and their beauty. So it's tying all those things together. So let's see. I think this one makes this pointer. Whoops. Oh, okay. I've never used one of these before. Excuse me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so in, in this drawing, I have, it was just fun to go through these notebooks because I have probably 10 or 12 of these with like 100 pages and um, just, I, and I only have a couple of um, a couple of the drawings from these travels, but the point of this is to show, um, when you look at something, when you spend the time to draw something, you're, you're really taking in how it's built and um, um, it just taught me to look at things um, anatomically. So these are sort of buildings looked at anatomically. Um, so this is an elevation, of, well, it's sort of an elevation, <coughs> three-dimensional, and then what is important about this is that this is the floor plan um, of that building, and then this is a, um, an aerial view of the building, and I was looking at the parking structure, how the landscape was interfacing with the buildings, and, um, and so it just traveled with a little tiny um, watercolor set and, um, and my pencil, basically, and uh, I took in all these buildings. And um, the wonderful thing that I learned through architecture was to see things, um, yeah, in three dimensions. Um, so then this is another study of, uh, let's see, this was the Herald Building um, in Scotland. And the most beautiful facade was in this out, in this sort of tight um, streetway. So I got up on a roof and <laughs> convinced some people across the way to let me up onto the roof. I think I was, this is my 20s, traveling through Europe. And um, so I just did, I just drew and drew and drew and drew and drew, and that's where my love of drawing came from. And then um, this is a little table done by Charles McIntosh. It was built in 1912. And again, it's just about learning how to see and draw. And um, um, it's in the top. Yeah, that's just clearly like a three-dimensional little drawing. And then this was the study of uh, this table in uh, elevation and the floor plan. And, um, and this is a little detail of how this, uh, these legs came together. And that's was just what I love. I just spend um, hours in these museums just studying furniture and, and architecture in the streets. Uh, this, is a little, excuse me, this is a little door, um, what's it? a door that is in the, um, one of Charles McIntosh's tea rooms. Um, and again, this is um, my little watercolor set. And um, Charles McIntosh was very influenced by nature. And that's one of the things I loved about his work is he integrated um, uh, nature into a lot of his designs. And um, so this is um, these pewter, these beautiful pewter, um, beautifully crafted and um, uh, pewter, this is stained glass. and. Um, these were these pewter panels and this beautiful wood, and you could look through the glass into the tea room behind. But um, everything that he did was very ornate, and I was just fascinated by his work, and um, I spent a fair amount of time studying him when I, in my travels. And so the point of all that is that um, I moved to Jackson. Um, let's see, I, I was planning on going to, um, I had an actual job in Seattle when I was, um, I think I was 27, and I was moving to Seattle, and I thought I'd come to Jackson to ski for a year. <laughs> and um, so one thing led to another, and I fell in love with the mountains here, and um, stayed for a, I, I skied for winter, stayed for a summer, and then just sort of, I fell in love with the landscape and mountains and um, the wildlife, and um, starting 
my sketchbook started to change from architecture to anatomy of animals. So I've always loved horses, and so this is a study of um, a horse leg. So I started studying um, uh, the three-dimensional aspects of animals. Uh, this is just a little hippo um, drawing that uh, I pulled out of a sketchbook. Um, and then this, this is a little sketch that I did. It's kind of funny. It was a planning and zoning committee, because I've, I've worked in architecture here in Jackson for about seven years. And during that time, um, and this is right when I was transitioning from architecture into, into a world of art. And um, I, it's kind of funny, because I did this little drawing in a, a planning and zoning um, meeting. And I thought, OK, maybe it's time to start making some transitions, <laughs> because I wasn't focusing on what I was supposed to be focusing on. So um, I love this little drawing. and um, it. Uh, it's just a, a, an example of um, um, painting from memory and um, just things that you like to, to, um, to draw. Um, so I started studying um, a lot of wildlife, famous wildlife painters, um, Char um, Robert Bateman being a very um, important influence. Um, this is a little study that I did of one of his paintings, and I learned a lot by, um, studying, by studying and drawing other um, painters. Um, wildlife painters, and um, so this was a little sketch of a mouse that he did, and um, on the other side of this, um, this is pulled out of the sketchbook, and on the other side there's a um, recipe of, for granola, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is a really early little watercolor, and one of the things that I learned from architecture um, was a love for watercolor, and it was really interesting, I'm listening to Amy, her, trans her transferring from watercolor to um, oils, and I'll talk about that in a second, but this was an early painting. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is, this is an early um, painting, just fascinated by watercolor. Um, and this is another little early watercolor painting, and um, these slides are interesting, they transfer. This is a little tiny 5 by 5 painting um, that has a building in it, so it's, it kind of combines my interest of uh, architecture and this is right when I was transferring out of architecture into uh, painting as a uh, painting for as a full-time artist. Um, so it's a yeah, it's a fun little it, it's a fun little watercolor painting there. Uh, this is a special little painting because uh, it was the first day that I had left my architecture career and um, decided to paint full-time. And similar to um, to um, Dustin, or, uh, I had saved up enough money to support myself for a year and just decided to um, make a big, a huge leap of faith and um, pursue painting full time. And this was the full, first painting that I did. Uh, so I woke up and I was like, okay, this is my, the, the beginning of my new life. And um, I went out to Snow King and um, did this little painting um, of the, the well, actually it was the day prior. And um, I saw this, the moon coming up, it was kind of like early afternoon moon. and when the moon is in the full blue sky. And um, so, I actually, so I saw the painting first. I thought, I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to paint this painting. And um, I came back the next day, and I did the, um, the trees and the landscape. And um, I waited for this moon. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and it never showed up. So um, the title of this little painting is Stood Up by the Moon. So um, I, but I remembered what it, was like, what it looked like, and so I just painted in what I had, what I had remembered. Um, so this was sort of a um, beginning um, in watercolor, and so I painted in watercolor um, for about um, about four or five years, um, and I and I was part of Trio Fine Art. I have cats here, um, which was a, a great a great venture, and um, so what watercolor taught me about painting is what Amy talked about is that there's it's very fragile. You have to be you have to plan carefully um, because corrections are really challenging to um, to make. And so um, there's and there's a fragility to watercolor and, um, and a freshness and it's, it's, spont it's spontaneous and it's very challenging. Um, so I brought a lot of that um, training in watercolor into my oil painting. Um, and this is a watercolor done um, after, I think I've been painting full time for a couple years. and. Um, what Andrew is saying is really true, is that when you spend more and more time in the studio, you just become more facile with your art. And it, it, um, and so this was a watercolor I've done of a, of a herd of horses um, off of Wenzel Lane, um, maybe a few years into my career. And this is another little watercolor. This is a small one too, it's five by seven, which is the favorite. Um, 
and watercolor, there's just a freshness um, and a spontaneity to watercolor that is, um, and it's sort of an abstraction too. Um, watercolor in its own right is really abstract. If you look down, um, yeah, right down here, um, it has its own, like, and it just does this on its own, which is so, so fun. And one of the things I do love about watercolor, and I'm slowly moving back to watercolor. I painted watercolor and now have done oils and big charcoals for a long time and getting back to watercolor because of the abstraction and the spontaneity. And um, so this, this is a little bit out of sequence because um, this is making a little bit of a leap to oil. But what I wanted to talk about was inspiration and, um, and a little bit of a respect for the muse and and when I began as a career, what I realized is that there's a point in time when you find something that you fall in love with and, um, and you just see paintings, like this is a painting of a group of horses on the Snake River Ranch. And um, I think it's a question that I often get from people is how do you, how, how are you inspired? And it's such a complicated um, combination of so many things and it's so intuitive that um, like in this particular instance, I was driving out to the village and um, saw a, a horse in the meadow with, um, it was black and white and it was surrounded by all this buff colored grass and then the horses surrounding it were also, um, there was a, there were some buckskins and then this pink palomino, uh, this pinto palomino, excuse me, um, right here um, was just surrounded this other horse and it, and it's, um, I traveled with my camera and um, I just, Pull off, pull off the road all the time and, and take photographs. So, and then you, and I've learned over time that when the muse strikes, you really need to pay attention and get as much information as you can because you might, you might go through a dry spell. So it's nice to have um, um, a whole series of, um, of slides and inspiration, which I do have now. So this is um, another um, painting done from that, um, that group of, uh, it was actually this was in the Western Vision show last year. And um, another thing that I do uh, is I'll, I'll bring elements of um, photographs um, in this particular one. It's kind of weird to look at this angle, but um, so this particular piece I um, brought in. Um, the whole, I took a whole, 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 whole series of photographs. I'll take like 200 photographs and work from three or four or five or six. But um, I do think I did three paintings from this little stop. But um, this horse, um, I loved his head and how it was turned around like this. And then in a couple of other pictures, my photograph that I took of the same horse, he had this fabulous tail. And so I painted this head and then this tail together, and it creates this really nice circular composition. Um, so, um, and it's, um, it's interesting that, um, yeah, there are particular parts in the painting you can't wait to paint. So um, in this particular instance, it was this head, and, um, and I just uh, loved how the light was catching on the side of, on the side of his head, and then, um, and then this white shape on his back, and then this tail is just fabulous, just catching all this air. And, um, so it's, um, it's um, just fun to be able to put, that's what kind of artist, um, you can just put together what you want to put together, and, um, and creating the painting is as fun as actually painting it. It's just coming up with all the ideas of how it's all going to come together. And then the horse in the background is almost a support for the painting. And I like to think of paintings as um, um, like a basketball team. And you have all this support around sort of the star role. And in this painting, like this is um, this this eye and the nose, this kind of where your eye lands when you're looking at the painting. And um, a really good painting is actually pretty complicated and to make something simple is quite complex and um, in this particular painting there is um, all of the support around um, so when you look at this painting your eye naturally bounces around and um, falls really on this part of the painting so um, making something work um, is uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of complex things going on um, to make it look simple um, so I want to talk a little bit about my process. Um, I do a lot of drawings, and this comes from um, watercolor painting because, um, and similar to Amy actually, um, uh, because I plan so carefully what I'm doing, I don't really, uh, I think my paintings have a certain amount of freshness. Uh, I do a series of studies, and I, so I know where I'm going when I start um, with a canvas with oil. And, um, uh, 
and I use the, I paint on um, gessoed Belgian linen, which bounces light back. It just any, any kind of primed linen will do that, but um, I paint very thinly, so I think both of those aspects give my oil, oils a sort of freshness that comes from watercolor painting. So, um, and I just do little sketches on the side, and I, as I'm drawing, I get ideas about um, the size and where I want things to be, and um, this is the final painting from that sketch. Um, and then, um, yeah, I love this little guy. So, so they're, they're, they're very thought through before I paint them. <coughs> then I, I have this sense of confidence where I'm going with the painting when I start, and that, that takes a little bit of the um, scariness away from painting because looking at blank canvas is um, a little daunting, <laughs> always. <laughs> so um, this is another little sketch of a painting I recently did of two Belgians. Um, and so I, here I'm just studying the, um, the mass, the massing of the composition, um, where I wanted to crop it. Um, and then this is that, that final painting from, uh, from that sketch. Uh, this is a little uh, drawing, or some just sketches out this is sort of a typical sketch out of my notebook. Um, and just figuring out uh, the, all the different shapes, putting things together. Let's see, this um, This is kind of, I'll show you two slides from here, and um, here you can see where I'm kind of, there's another bird here, I sketched it out, and then um, I, I, yeah, I erased it out of there, and then this bird up here in my final painting scooched over, so I sort of have, again, some idea about where I'm going when I get started, and then um, when I'm doing these drawings, I'm kind of envisioning the painting too, so um, you can hear, see this, this little note, it says there's a brightness on top, there's a warm light below, um, I think over here I'm talking about like the different stages that I'm going to paint this painting. So I kind of think out loud on my on, in my notebooks um, about what I think is going to work. Um, and so this little painting um, is, the, is I think it's a 24 by 24, and um, of some magpies that were outside of my window. I took a lot of photographs of them. They're just absolutely beautiful. They were on a little tiny um, wire, which would like a composition that works, so I just changed that wire into a rod because it was, it just needed more, more weight in the composition. And then, um, and then they get, this is just a second one. And, um, and it's fun to have a little, like, little playful moments where you're kind of, I'm finished with this painting and then I thought, well, let's put a little snow on there and like have a little, little snow trickling down. So you just kind of have a little bit of play with things. Um, this is one more sketch, um, and uh, again, I'm just figuring out where the composition is going to, how it's going to come together. With this particular piece, I wanted to, um, I thought that, I, initially it was going to cut it off right here, and then I thought, well, this horse needs a little bit more space. And compositionally, too, one thing I've worked with is a lot of negative space, and I really like a lot what Andrew is talking about with the composition, with, with that sort of contemporary approach. And a lot of my work, I focus on um, the essence of an animal, and so the backgrounds really drop away. And so I try to work, uh, I, my, my um, intent is to have a lot of negative space shapes and have those shapes be as interesting as the animals themselves and sort of a backdrop. And again, the support for the animals, your focus goes right to the animal. And that way I think it captures a lot of the essence of, 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 of what that animal's about. And this is that, that Final painting, and this is a pretty big painting. I think it's um, it's I think s uh, seven, six feet wide, and um, and when I painted it, um, yeah, I can see that there, there were these negative spaces here as in the drawing, and um, but they just said it was too harsh, um, so and these are things that what's what really fun about painting is it's a journey, and so the paintings often will speak. But you have an idea about where you're going, and they'll speak back to you. Like with this one, um, when it was almost finished, this edge was too harsh, and there's all these really nice soft things going on right there in the background, and then kind of blending it into this horse. And then um, this was too, um, this edge was too harsh. I just took a rag and pulled out some of the darkness of the horse, and it just gives it a softness that is more consistent with the entire painting because you don't want your eye to get stuck on you know hard edges. Um, so <laughs> this is a painting when people ask, or this is a, a little slide that, um, uh, a little bit about background and um, uh, I just fell in love with horses and, and, and animals and similar to I had. I grew up around, um, uh, around coyotes and magpies and horses and just kind of out in, in the wilderness and well, out in, in Nevada where there's a lot of open space and um, just fell in love with animals. So that's kind of, I think, um, 
um, that when you have an affinity, I, I think um, my uh, goal as a painter is to share the way I see the world, and I keep my I keep my life pretty simple and quiet, and that allows me to see things, express that allows me to connect it with nature, and then put that on canvas and share that with people. So that's part of um, what I'm hoping to get across as a painter. Um, sort of share share that with people and hope that um, they can appreciate nature on a different level. Um, I did want to talk for just a second, which I thought was a really interesting um, question that um, to address in regards to being an artist are um, there's a lot of challenges and rewards and um, yeah, it, it, I, I, I feel incredibly blessed to be able to be a painter. It, it, it's not an easy road, um, but it's, you get, um, there, like it's a labor of love, and um, there are some hard times, and, uh, and then really incredibly rewarding times. And it's the rewarding times that keep, keep you going and um, keep you inspired. So it's partially, it's kind of full circle. I didn't love to paint because I love the subject matter, I love design, and then seeing people appreciate the work um, makes it come full circle. And it still amazes me that I can create something that people can put on their walls and and, and fall in love with. And so um, I had a couple of things that happened to me in, in my uh, career as a painter. Um, and I think one of the most touching things was um, a friend of mine wanted to buy a little painting of, it was when I was a trio fine art, it was a 12 by 24 painting of two um, paint horses. And she was deciding if she wanted to buy it or not, and she was going to um, put new hardwood floors in the kitchen, and she decided to forego her hardwood floors so that she could buy this painting. And I was just stunned by that. Just so you have these little tiny moments where you realize how much people love art and how much it means to them. So it's an honor to be a part of that whole cycle. Um, so um, I'd like to thank the museum and everyone for coming out and um, for your enthusiasm for art and also all of us here as artists would not be here without your enthusiasm and your support. It's so challenging and every time someone says I love what you do and it's, it fuels us to keep going. So thank you everybody. Have a